Hello and you're very welcome to this information session on the Bachelor of Arts programme at Mary Immaculate College. That is MI002 on the CAO. Um, my name is Rachel Godfrey and I am the uh, Faculty Administrator in the Faculty of Arts and I'm going to host tonight's session. So all of this week we are hosting information sessions on the, on the Bachelor of Arts programme and tonight we are going to look at four subjects that are offered on the programme and those subjects are psychology, German, music and English. So you'll hear from um, a member of each of those departments in a few moments and at the end of the session there'll be about a half an hour for questions and answers. So if you have a particular question about any one of those subjects or about the programme in general, please do use the question and answer function um, on the session and we'll get to your questions at the end. Um, if, there, if there are more general questions, I can handle those, but if this is your absolute unique opportunity to ask specific questions that you might have about the subjects that you're going to hear about shortly. So we start things off with uh, Dr. John Perry, who is the head of the Department of Psychology here at Mary Mackin College, and he's going to give you an overview of what it might be like to study psychology here at MIC. So I'll hand you over now to John. Hi there, my name's John. I'm head of Department of Psychology here at Mary Immaculate College. Uh, you can see some details on the screen there in terms of how you might want to contact me uh, if you have any questions, but also I'll be in the live Q&A session uh, that follows these talks as well. So feel free to fire away any questions. So I'm just going to borrow 10 to 15 minutes of your time, if that's OK, to talk about psychology uh, how we deliver psychology at Mary Immaculate College and the, the kind of things you might expect to study and why you might study it and where that, where that might lead. So I'm going to begin by talking about what psychology is. And I'll preface this by telling you what it isn't, OK, because sometimes there's some myths about psychology, certainly having worked as a psychologist for a long time now, um, people often kind of will make the same kind of jokes that oh, you'd be busy with my family kind of thing, uh, which is grand, but um, but also there's misconceptions as well. People thinking there's some sort of voodoo mind reading kind of stuff. There's also sometimes a misconception that psychology is just about fixing people's problems. Um, it's much broader than that. So there's a strand of psychology called clinical psychology, which I can touch on later. Um, but actually, a lot of psychology is sometimes about the subject of psychology and understanding how people work in a sense, understanding people. Um, and also it's about trying to maximise people's outcomes. So not just about preventing the bad stuff happening, but having this kind of positive impact on people so people can hopefully lead their best, most fulfilling lives they're able to. So we define it as the scientific study of mind and behaviour. Um, that's interesting that it's a scientific study. Um, it kind of it's on an arts degree, so it bridges the sort of the humanities into the sciences, really. And I think uh, the most simple way to think about it is we're trying to understand why. We're trying to understand cause and effect. Why do people think the way they think? feel the way they feel and act the way they act. And the reason I say cause and effect is because if we know the causes of certain thoughts and feelings and behaviours, then we're able to determine the extent to which they're stable. So they're going to continue to keep happening and then wonder whether we're able to cause some change there, which has a change on the effects. We have more positive beneficial outcomes for individuals and groups and so on. Now, I've given an example in a, an image there to, to illustrate the cause and effect. This comes from a very famous experiment by a psychologist called Martin Seligman in 1967. Now, Seligman was actually interested in depression at the time. Now, anybody with some knowledge of depression will know that one of the one of the com common symptoms is um, uh, kind of this fatalist appro approach towards the future, seeing that 
there's no positive outcomes in the future. Therefore, there's no kind of point in investing effort in what you do today. Um, so he was he was stumbling across something he went on to call learned helplessness. And the experiment he did here included dogs. So he had two groups of dogs that were in different conditions. OK, while the first group of dogs uh, were kept in kennels for the first part, a second group of dogs were put in a box um, a little bit different from the box you can see on the screen there, but it had a floor that administered a mild electric shock. And there wasn't an area that didn't administer a mild electric shock. Every so often the buzzer would go and the floor would shock the dog, not to harm them, um, but it was unpleasant. And the dog couldn't escape that. That was called an inescapable um, electric shock condition while the other dogs were waiting in the kennels. The second part of the experiment included a box like you can see on the screen there, where half of the floor administered a mild electric shock, and the other half did not administer any kind of electric shock. And there was a small partition wall in between that the dogs could very easily jump over, okay? So this was known as an escapable electric shock condition. So the dogs were all placed in the half of the box that administered the electric shock on the floor, and all of the dogs that were in the kennel condition first, so hadn't been in the first box, once they received this electric shock, they jumped over the partition and no longer received any electric shocks, as you would do. They've experienced an unpleasant situation, so they've removed themselves from that. However, when this was done with the second group of dogs who had been in the inescapable electric shock condition, they found that the vast majority of them, when they received the electric shock, just continued to receive the electric shock. They didn't jump over the partition because, of course, they didn't know that the floor prevented no uh, shock on the other side. But this was the, the notion of learned helplessness because their previous experiences have taught them that whatever you do doesn't make a difference. This is inescapable. This is life. They just accepted it. And think about how that relates to um, people in everyday life. I think one of the most common examples I can think of is when people say they can't do maths. You think everyone can do maths um, to a different degree, but really what happens is you have a negative experience of something. Therefore, you, you stop trying because you start getting these concrete ideas Therefore, there's no point putting any effort in anymore, and that's what learned helplessness is. So that's just one very simple um, theory. They're the kind of things that we that we might look at to understand why people respond the way they do in different situations. Now that would be an example of research, okay? So that's research where we're learning about psychology as the subject. And that's a lot of what an undergraduate degree, like a bachelor's degree in psychology does. You're not going to come and study psychology in a degree and walk out as a psychologist and be ready to treat people. Um, you'll study largely in the first couple of years at least the subject of psychology. You'll learn more about uh, various experiments and types of psychology over the years. Then towards the end, we start looking at how that research affects applications, the actual practice of psychology, how we influence people in the real world. So let's say you study the subject of psychology. What does that actually mean? Well, there's six main areas and you need to include these six main areas to have accreditation with the Psychological Society of Ireland. And that's what this, this program has. The first area is personality and individual differences. Now, we all kind of have an idea of what personality is. OK, you may have even heard of some of the psychological terms such as introversion and extroversion and neuroticism and those kind of things. And um, personality is about these characteristics that people have. So people might be um, ambitious. They might be honest people. They might be selfish people. It's not to say that they will always behave in that certain way. 
but that's the way that kind of comes naturally to them. And because people have these kind of predictive patterns, we're able to use uh, often psychometric assessments to be able to predict people's over observable behavior. So that's what we do in personality. We also look at things like social psychology and social psychology is a way of explaining how our behavior is manipulated by the social world around us. Like peer pressure, for example, the image that's on the screen on the social there is the Stanley Milgram experiment, which again was a very famous experiment where people would administer what they believe to be potentially lethal electric shocks to somebody else because they got a question wrong in a, in a psychological experiment. They weren't actually shocking them. It, we're not allowed to do these kind of things so much in psychology now, but back in the 60s, you could get away with a lot more. Um, but there was a level of obedience there because there was pressure, there was scientists in lab coats telling them to do it. So people would do it. So we understand now the social world around us affects our behaviours and our thoughts. We also look at developmental psychology, and this is right across the lifespan. This can be from actually prenatal up to those really early stages of infancy through to childhood, right through to uh, later elements of life and understanding various milestones and uh, how the brain develops and how we um, understand situations and are able to make decisions as we get older. We look at biological psychology, which is the different parts of the brain that might deal with uh, memory or logical uh, reasoning or some of the emotional kind of centres and, and how they kind of interact with each other. We look at cognitive psychology, which includes decision making and how we process information. We use memory and past experiences. Uh, we make decisions, that kind of thing. And because it is a scientific study throughout the programme, we also look at how we actually do research and how we can set up and conduct these kind of experiments. And you will do some of those experiments. Now, where does this lead? Well, about 10 or 20 percent of you will probably get a degree in psychology and go on and be a psychologist. And that can be any area that could be it could be a clinical psychologist, uh, which is sort of the first one that people think of, which is to help people with um, disorders. Um, it could be in forensic, you know, working in, um, in in crime. It could be sports psychology. That's my background, worked as a sports psychologist for years. Occupational, you know, work psychology, educational, you could become a researcher. And I mentioned that's 10 to 20 percent of people. So what happens to the rest? Well, they still use psychology, but they go into other areas of um, what we call allied professions, where you might still work in health, not as a psychologist, but your undergraduate training in psychology helps you to understand how people uh, think and feeling and acting and, and that can help you in in your role. You could get into health promotion or you could get into a different form of marketing and advertising. Again, understanding why people are, are responding to situations and how they respond to influence certainly is a big part of that. You could get into human resourcing um, and, and personal development. Now, we have three psychology degrees. We have, we have the Bachelor of Arts, which you're learning about today. You'll also come across the education and psychology degree. It's the same psychology content that's studied on both of those programmes. And from September 2022, we'll have a single honours degree in psychology as well. Now, all of that should be uh, accredited, is accredited by the Psychological Society of Ireland. Now, that's really important because it means if you want to go on and train to be a psychologist in the future, um, you don't have to do an extra conversion course. You can go straight on to the postgraduate programmes that you would require. There are some practical considerations. Um, we have a maximum around 40 spaces. It can change slightly year on year in the second year of the programme. Um, that normally matches around about the amount of students that are interested in following it um, to degree, degree level. 
the second year elective would have to be IT and psychology because that's a uh, part of the requirements for the accreditation. Uh, so you can't do the teaching English as a foreign language, which you'll have heard about. And when it gets to the third year of the arts programme and you do either the study abroad or the placement, you actually only do one semester and then we bring you back on campus uh, as long as there's not a pandemic um, to be able to study psychology for, for the spring semester in that year. And again, that's because you need to study a certain amount of credits in psychology to get that accredited uh, degree. But the degree is accredited and you can go on and study a master's degree alongside people that have done a single honours psychology degree at other institutions. And in fact, many of our graduates do. And the dissertation that you'll have heard about as well, the individual piece of research you do at the end um, must also be in psychology. So that's my presentation. I'll say thanks for listening because as that as that um, theoretical model shows at the bottom there, once I show gratitude, it, it manipulates your um, uh, positive affect. So it means you're more likely to feel positive about this talk if I say thanks compared to if I don't say thanks. So uh, we're, we're all a bunch of manipulators really. So thanks ever so much for listening and I look forward to receiving some questions during the, the question and answer. Cheers. OK, so thanks very much, John, for that very interesting presentation on psychology. So before we go over to our next presentation, I'm just going to remind you again that if you have any questions for the faculty today, you can use the question and answer function and we will get to your questions at the end of the session. So our next speaker today is Dr. Christiane Schoenfeld, who is the head of the German Studies Department, and now you're going to hear about what it might be like to take German as one of your subjects on the degree program, the arts degree program here at Mary Maffitt College. So I'm going to hand over now to Christiane. Hello, you're very welcome to German studies at Mary Immaculate College. My name is Christiane Schoenfeld. I'm the head of the department and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the program and about German studies in general. Due to Brexit, Germany and Ireland have been developing much closer ties in recent years, but culturally the two countries have actually been linked and inspiring one another for many decades. On our campus, for example, you'll come across several beautiful works by the German-Irish sculptor Imogen Stewart. Irish-German relations and intercultural competency are integral parts of our programme at MIC. In view of the digitalised and globalised world we live in today and the skills that are required in the future. German is the first language of the largest group of people in Europe. It's of course spoken in Germany, in Austria, in Switzerland, in the small country of Liechtenstein, but also in parts of Central and Eastern Europe, in Luxembourg, regions of France, Belgium, and Italy, and even in communities in South America. Studying German is about knowledge, skills and access. It doesn't matter if you're a beginner or have only little German skills or if you did your leaving cert in German. Our program caters to both Albinicios and advanced students. Our program focuses on language, culture and intercultural competence. Due to the supportive learning environment we provide and our innovative approaches to teaching and learning, I'm sure you'll excel in the language and also in your intercultural competence and thus gain access to the strongest economy and job market within the European Union. The Irish government has identified German as a key language. Speaking English and Irish is simply not enough anymore. The European Union recommends that we all speak our mother tongue plus two European languages. But learning languages and learning about other cultures also means gaining new perspectives on your own culture, of course, but it also helps you to communicate successfully with others abroad. And it'll help you, you know, gaining language and transferable skills will help you to make your mark in today's multicultural and multilingual societies and also classrooms. Classrooms are getting more and more complex. The former um, Chancellor of Germany, Willy Brandt, once said, if I'm selling to you, I speak your language, but if I'm buying, dann müssen Sie Deutsch sprechen, then you have to be able to speak German. And that really hasn't changed. Our programme is structured around two core elements. As I mentioned before, we focus on both language skills and culture. So in language, you'll gain language awareness. You'll become aware of the structures, the grammar. Um, you'll 
develop communication skills, writing skills, translation skills. Uh, you learn about linguistics, but also about how language teaching and learning actually works. All this then is placed in the context of culture because you can't really understand the language properly and develop your intercultural competence without being aware of what we call culture. And that consists of current affairs, history and politics, literature and film, social context, and also about Ireland and its place within Europe and about Irish-German relations. During year three of your studies with us, you will have the opportunity to spend one or two semesters in a German speaking country, either at a university in Germany, Austria or Switzerland, or working as a foreign language teaching assistant at a school in Germany or Austria. Going abroad has been a hugely positive experience for our students. I've received so much enthusiastic feedback over the years and I'm just giving you two testimonials here from uh, two students that had different experiences but both extremely positive. Sarah worked as a teacher in a bilingual kindergarten and primary school in Berlin. So she was speaking English and German, working with small children, and she said her time in Berlin was the best experience of her life to date. Um, Carol Ann uh, went to Augsburg University for years. She was an Erasmus exchange student. Uh, she also received a scholarship from the DRD that the department was um, able to, to you know, help her with. Um, and for her, the opportunity to, to study in Germany as part of the Erasmus programme was the highlight of her time at Mary Immaculate College. And I have to say, I mean, going abroad really helps students to excel in their language skills. Some of them come back and they're a near native in the language. So we highly recommend that students go abroad and obviously travelling back and forth is normally very easy. Um, at the moment, of course, it's all suspended due to the pandemic, but we're hopeful that that will change very soon. And if you need another reason to uh, decide whether you want to study uh, German or not, did you know that proficiency in different languages makes your brain work better overall? In an article in The Guardian, it said a steady stream of studies over the past decade has shown that bilinguals outperform monolinguals in a range of cognitive and social tasks from verbal and nonverbal tests to how well they can read other people. This includes a superior ability to concentrate, solve problems and focus, as well as a lesser chance to develop dementia. So that's something to take into account, I think, to be able to focus and to solve problems to be able to analyze um, and present your findings, uh, to communicate effectively, are all skills that are becoming increasingly important in our globalized economy. Um, and they're all transferable skills that you'll acquire while studying German with us. We need people that are able to connect the dots, to cross-pollinate ideas from a wealth of disciplines, as Maria Popova said. And uh, studying German is probably the most interdisciplinary thing you can do. And you'll acquire skills that are also increasingly important in education. So if you're interested in becoming a teacher, this is also vital that you acquire these skills. So as you're preparing for a career in a globalized, digitalized society, remember that studying German opens up a wide range of possible careers, especially in view of a changing economy. With a Bachelor of Arts with German studies, you'll have the choice to work in Ireland or abroad. And due to the fact that we're a small department and um, we teach in small groups, um, you'll benefit from a lot of extra support and have access to international funding and exchange programmes. So I hope you'll decide to study German at Mary Immaculate College. If you uh, want further information, just check our website. Uh, the website is linked below. You can find it under academic departments and then click on German. Um, and there's also my email address, christiane.schonfeld at uh, mic.ul.ie. And I'll be happy to answer your questions later on. Uh, but also, if you think of something that you'd like to uh, ask, just send me an email and I'll get back to you. Okay, thanks very much. All the best and stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Tschüss. Thank you very much, Christiane. Um, that was very interesting.
Before we head over to our next speaker from the Department of Music, I just wanted to remind you that we have a, more sessions, uh, information sessions on the BA programme uh, this week, tomorrow and Thursday evening, uh, both starting again at 5 p.m. We will have information sessions on other subjects that are offered on the BA programme. So the next subject that we're going to look at tonight is music. So I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Gareth Cox, who is the head of the music department. Well, thank, thank you, Rachel. Um, yes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about music in the uh, in the in the program, uh, the arts program in in Mary Matlock College. You, you can take music to degree level, um, and you can take it maybe just as a subject in in first year. Some students take it for uh, j just the just the uh, just the first year, and some take it all the way through to uh, to degree level. Um, we normally have about uh, maybe 20, 25 students in first year, and maybe a half of those students would would uh, would take it uh, to degree level. So those are the sort of the numbers. Um, so uh, you'd have you have uh, plenty of uh, opportunity for um, uh, individual um, uh, tutorials, and so when you're working. Um, when you're working with uh, with the staff here, and so so the numbers. That's a little bit about the numbers. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the uh, the the program here. Um, I'll just go to the uh, the first slide there. The first slide has come up there now. I'm just seeing it. Yeah. So the studying music at Mary Macleod College. You really need to um, be passionate about music. Um, you want to ask yourself: Do you enjoy uh, playing music and uh, singing? Do you like listening to music and going to concerts and so? Um, are you uh, are you uh, interested in learning particularly uh, and understanding how music works? Um, and are you interested in developing your music writing uh, skills and so? Uh, and do you want to learn about music history and uh, to discover a whole range of different kinds of music and so? So those are some of the questions you might want to uh, might want to ask yourself before you before you uh, take music as a subject. Um, we'll go to the uh, the the second slide, the um, with a list of uh, modules. If they should just come up now, if they can come up. The, now, could the the uh, the second slide should, could just come up there on modules? There's a a list of modules, please. Uh, you can see that. That's sorry about that. That's come up now. Um, this is really the the content of the course, and to give you an idea of the sort of um, uh, subject areas you'll be looking at, uh, particularly theory and techniques. Theory and techniques goes uh, goes right through the whole uh, the whole program. You learn um, about the uh, the rudiments and uh, terminology, language of music. You get a course of ear training, keyboard harmony. You learn how to write music um, and how to write in different different styles and from uh, different. Uh, different periods, and you can see there on the second one that it goes to arranging and uh, and uh, composition as it goes through. So typically, then in second year, you would be learning to write, for instance, or arrange pieces for uh, say string quartet or for choir. And then when you get to uh, final year, there's free composition. Um, so you're learning to write in in uh, arrange in different styles and write uh, uh, compositions as well. So Really, this gives you an idea of understanding the music and the process of music, rather than us just presenting you with a product of a of a Mozart string quartet, for instance. You learn to write even short exercises in that style, so it's a sort of more uh, a process based too. So you learn music from the inside out, as it were. So theory and techniques goes all the way through, and it's particularly important in. Uh, um, uh, the, the very first semester, we really need uh, quite a lot of time in the very first semester to uh, get everybody up to speed with the with the uh, with uh, rudiments and, and theory and so. Um, you you learn music in uh, diff from different historical periods. Um, there in music history, uh, you look at important uh, issues, key developments in music during the period, looking at selected works by selected composers, and looking them at them within their social and political. Uh, context and um, uh, the music history um, uh, runs through the the program as well through the four years. Um, Irish traditional music too. Uh, we we look at Irish traditional music to understand 
um, uh, traditional music in relation to so historical context, social context, international context as well. Um, and we developed specific analytical skills uh, there to appreciate um, Irish traditional music as well. You can see a performance, I'll come back to in a minute, um, and uh, uh, popular music, the um, history and language of popular music, film music, jazz, development of rock music, uh, blues and so. Uh, that's all uh, there in popular music, uh, music technology using computer software and hardware for creating and editing sharing sound files, musical scores, using the internet as a resource. And you also have an undergraduate um, an undergraduate dissertation uh, in final year, uh, where you can specialize then in a particular research area, an area uh, that you might be particularly interested. It might be in Irish traditional music, it might be in uh, in performance, uh, it might be in music therapy, for instance, or, or, or local history. So there's many different possibilities and you have a supervisor who will uh, take you through that with your undergraduate um, dissertation. Now, the, uh, if we go to the next uh, slide on performance, as I said, I, I, I skipped over performance because I wanted to come back uh, talk about that separately. Performance, uh, performance goes right through the whole uh, program, um, but you can see on your on your slide there that um, there are many different possibilities uh, to perform as well. We have a choral society, um, performs a concert each year. There's a community choir, uh, the U University Limerick Orchestra, which our staff and students play in, um, uh, do a uh, perform, present a, a concert, a couple of concerts each year. And um, there are various Irish traditional music ensembles. Um, there are, uh, there's a musical every year. Uh, many concerts. Now the concerts not just to uh, uh, perform in, but also to go to. We try to build in uh, concerts into um, many aspects of the program where, for instance, if again, if I go back to an idea about studying a string quartet, well, we try and go to a string quartet concert as well, where you might write a, a program note before it, uh, talk about, uh, look at various recordings, go to the concert, engage critically with that concert and write a review of it afterwards or so as maybe as part of the assessment and so. So concerts are very much something that you we encourage our students to uh, to, to go to and, uh, and engage with. And we have many uh, uh, practice facilities in the in the college, so plenty of places to, um, uh, uh, to practice. Um, while I'm on performance there, I'd say yeah, there is a performance aspect of in each year. You uh, There's a practical in first year, um, a second year and final year, a short one in first year, and then if you major, then a more substantial one in final year. So you will uh, be required to uh, perform um, throughout, throughout, the, um, throughout the program as well. Um, now, importantly, what uh, students particularly ask about is the are the entrance requirements. That's the next slide. Um, let's go to the next one there. That's the entrance requirements. Now, this is an important question that pe the students have. Now, as I said at the start about the uh, the, the the students, uh, the the number of students. As I say, we normally have about uh, uh, about twenty five students in first year, um, but but maybe you know, 35 or 40 at the start of the year um, uh, came along to, to us in first year and said, well, you know, I'd like to study music too. And some after a couple of weeks decided, well, maybe it's not for them. And that's, that's, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, we expect students to have a satisfactory standard of music literacy. So you should be able to at least know your way around uh, writing, you have, have written some music, um, um, a sort of around a sort of a grade four sort of theory standard. Um, uh, and I'll come back to that. And the ability to be able to play an instrument uh, and, and or sing, of course, singing uh, uh, also as well. Um, so we'd expect that from you at uh, at entry. So you can see there there that we have a, an advisory assessment. We don't we don't have an audition. You can see that at the bottom. There is no audition. We don't ask you to come in and perform for us. Um, be you know before the program even starts, or even in week week, week one. Uh, but we do um, we do offer a an advisory assessment where, and this is the the part of the music theory I was uh, mentioned there, where where we ask you to um, uh, will test you on 
some uh, scales, intervals, key signatures, and so that that sort of thing. Again, around a sort of a grade three or grade four uh, uh, standard. Now we we also we also ask you to fill in a a form on your musical background, so to see what you've what you've been doing uh, musically over the years. And you might you might you might have done uh, you might have taken a graded exam, grade six, a grade a piano or grade five violin. Or you might have played in a youth orchestra. You might have. Uh, uh, performed in musicals or in your uh, or in a local uh, choir um, uh, in the various trad sessions and so you know, there's many many different um, ways you might have come to music and, and we ask you to fill that in your musical background and whether you took music in the leaving uh, leaving certificate and, and and what you did there um, and based on that and then on the on the, the test that you did, we would then advise. So we, we would not keep anybody out of taking music if, if you wanted to uh, try it for a few weeks and see how you get on. That's absolutely fine. And if after a week or two you decide, well, actually, you prefer to do something else, that's that's fine as well. So we would advise as you go through to make sure that you're happy. And as I, that's why I mentioned the numbers. <clears throat> it usually settles down then after a while as people find their uh, uh, where they're comfortable and it settles down to about that sort of couple of dozen uh, and then and then after that they, uh, they, they they at the end of the year maybe about a dozen say well I'd like to go on and 10 or 12 will go on and take it <coughs> all the way all the way through so that's those are the entrance requirements so that's the most important bit that I suppose that people ask uh, there is there isn't an audition but you must be able to play uh, an instrument um, and uh, and and or sing and we'll 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 advise you then uh, in in week one. Um, <coughs> excuse me, as you go as you go through there. Now the next uh, slide is on um, uh, the other end, as it were, on careers in music. Um, as you can imagine, careers in music tend to be uh, in performance or in teaching. Um, uh, there are other possibilities in broadcasting, recording. Um, uh, journalism, librarianship, you can see them publishing uh, music therapy, arts administration. There are many different uh, different possibilities. The teaching one is, is of course, uh, always uh, popular. Again, a, a question that we're asked often um, about music uh, teaching. If you take music in Mary Macleod College, then you will uh, will you will have uh, satisfied the, the teaching council um, with all the various areas of music study that they require. You can see that in the second paragraph. Obviously, you have to go on <coughs> and do a PME, um, a professional master in education, um, and, uh, but, but the teaching council will, uh, will, be, will be happy that you've done uh, enough credits with, with us and, and all the areas. You, you, you visit that, uh, the, the teaching council website to see that. But that's, that's, so that's, that's all covered in our program. Um, uh, and you can you can you can visit it, but that's at the that's at the other end of the uh, of of the program. Um, uh, and the other one is interesting too, is that you can see that uh, the last paragraph that employers do recruit music graduates. This has been researched uh, over the years, a long time, and it's, it's proven that they do they're interested in music graduates in completely different areas because of the transferable skills. You can imagine the sort of skills that you might develop um, performing. Um, uh, in in, uh, in in a, in an ensemble, uh, the the ideas you have of presentation and memory and nerves and uh, those are all the sort of skills that a, that an employer might be might be interested in. Um, so they're, they're transferable skills. You can see uh, see that that's been um, discussed. So the the there is another uh, uh, area you can go to. If you in fact if you just if you just Google. Um, uh, something like careers in music, simply like that, you'll come across some excellent websites um, in in the UK and in America, which uh, list uh, uh, many many different careers in music. Some that you maybe never thought of, um, and uh, and some are quite quite detailed. So you'll you'll see a few, and you'll find them just simply by googling uh, careers in music. And uh, some of the big websites come up uh, some up straight away. So if you're interested in that, you can um, you can uh, you could do that. So those are the those are the careers. Now um, uh, I'll go to the last one, which just very simply says, uh, "Any questions?" Um, now you get the Department of Music website through through the main uh, college website. <coughs> My contact details are there. You can email me, and I'm going to be here for any questions at the end. But I think you've uh, overall you've got an idea there that uh, you've an idea of the 
the content of the program, um, the various performance opportunities, the uh, the entrance requirements, which are uh, important, obviously, and uh, and possible careers uh, at the other end. So, um, as I say, if you have any any questions, do uh, do get in touch. OK, right, Rachel, back to you. Thanks so much, Thanks so much Sarah. Sarah. So, so there was a very comprehensive presentation on, on studying music as part of the arts degree. degree. Um, um, just want to remind you that you can ask questions using the question and answer function. Um, not only for uh, questions that if you think it, if you think that your question has already been covered, but you don't quite understand, or maybe there is an aspect of something that was said in a presentation that you're you didn't quite understand, or you didn't quite hear. Please do use the question and answer function to ask the uh, faculty member to repeat it. We can go back over any points that people have particular interest in during the question and answer session. So just to remind you, this is your opportunity to ask those questions um, that you would like an answer to before you make that final decision on your CAO form. So our final presenter of the evening is Dr Eugene O'Brien, who is the head of the Department of English Language and Literature. So I'm going to pass over now to uh, Eugene and following Eugene's presentation, we will then go on to the question and answer portion of tonight's session. So over to you, Eugene. That's great. Thanks very much, Rachel. Apologies, the earlier one didn't go too well there. Um, I don't know what happened with that, some technological problem, but it doesn't make any difference. You're better off having it live. You're welcome. Um, and very happy to talk to you about English. In in this day and age, we've become very instrumental and we've become very um, we've become very focused on learning for something, you know, learning for a job, learning for a career, and you hear all that. And people often say, what's the value of learning about English? You're, you're dealing with imagination, you're dealing with words, you're dealing with, with stuff that maybe isn't seen as being um, that important. Well, I would completely disagree with that. And the best example I can give you of that is last Wednesday in Washington, D.C., when the words of one person were able to kind of get a crowd so fired up that they actually, in the name of patriotism to the United States, attacked the symbol of patriotism in the United States, the Capitol building. This was done through words. It was done through rhetoric. It was done through imagery. And it was done in a weird sort of way um, through a form of poetry where the rhythmic language, steal the vote, all this kind of stuff. Um, the slogans that were used were very much the use of language, not to inform, but to inflame. Now, in English, what we teach you is how to read and understand the way meanings of words are created. So we will look at texts going back as far as Shakespeare and um, going right up to contemporary uh, contemporary work like you may remember um, normal people that was televised there uh, during the last lockdown. Uh, we do that in our taught masters online. So we're doing very, very contemporary work. We're also going back as far as Shakespeare, looking at literary theory, cultural theory, all of that type of stuff. So in terms of its relevance, in terms of why you would study English, well, that's why. Because you need to understand the meaning behind terms like fake news and post-truth. And you can only understand those by understanding the language that's used and the way people are using that language. Nowadays, we're all writers. Um, you people will all have written an awful lot more on social media than any of the people teaching you will have done. And if you were to put together all the words you use on Snapchat, Instagram, um, Facebook, Twitter, there'd be hundreds of thousands of them. So you're involved in both consuming language as a reader and in producing language as a writer. And understanding literature and how it works is really important. So. That's the kind of philosophical reason. If you want to take a step back and look at the philosophy of why you would do English, you would do English for that reason. You would do English to understand language. You do English to understand um, how words work and how words create thoughts and how thoughts create feelings and how feelings create actions. 
That's the philosophical side of it. The practical side of it. Well, if you do English in Mary I, you're doing it for four years. Um, the first year we do an introductory module where we do drama, poetry and fiction. And then we will also do some literary and cultural theory. We will do some more poetry and we will do a different type of fiction like short stories. Um, we were looking for what you think it's if you were to put a, a kind of a second level perspective on it, it's not paper one in um, the leaving cert, it would be paper two. So what we're looking for you to do is to analyze, understand, compare, contrast, discuss. That's what we do. Um, and that's the way it will work. In the in the first uh, first semester, we take poems that you might never have seen before, very unusual, very contemporary ones, and we do those. Um, and what we will what we will try and do there, and I, I have them I have them here in front of me here. What we will try and do with those is we will try and get you to understand poems that you've never seen before. How poetic language works. Um, think of you know again in politics, but it's a good example. Yes, we can. Why does that resonate? Why does it work? Because it's three monosyllables and the rhythm is da, da, da. Yes, we can. The rhythm is important. The way you say things is important. The way words sound is important. Um, in drama, we do two very different texts with you in first year. We do The Winter's Tale by Shakespeare, which is a classic. Uh, it's a comedy. It's all about people pretending to be something they're not. And in these days of gender fluidity and transgender, it's an interesting case where all the female characters are played by men. And sometimes in Shakespeare's comedies, you will have female characters pretending to be male. So it's a man playing a woman who's pretending to play a man. It gets very confused, and very complicated. That should help us, I think, with, with, with contemporary issues. Same story with The Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. Powerful, powerful dramatic play where emotions are just right out there in front of you. And what we're trying to show you, I suppose, here is that literature goes, it's a continuum and yet it's not. Each age has its own conventions and its own ideas, but by the same token, there are commonalities in the way we read them. What are we looking for? Literature is very often about the individual rather than about the crowd. The crowd is there, but we're focusing on the individual. And I think that's important. Um, in fiction, we do two very, very different writers. We do a portrait of the artist as a young man uh, by James Joyce, and we do Ross Carl Kelly, should have got off at Sydney Parade. And again, you're saying, OK, that's kind of bonkers because one of them is high culture. If you want to impress your friends when you're in third level, you know, you can say, well, I was reading Joyce the other day and it was really interesting and people will be impressed by it. If you say I was reading Ross and Carl Kelly, people will kind of look at you. And yet they're both about young Dublin men, 100 years apart, who are making their way through life, who have an interest in girls and in their own culture. The two cultures are very, very different, but their interests are the same. And interestingly, they're both young men who start off very wealthy and by the end of each book, they're not. One of them is a comedy, one of them is serious. The aim of one of the books is to make you laugh. The aim of another book is to make you think. And we will read them to see how they achieve their aims and how they manage that. And um, that's more or less the way that we, we do what we're, what we're doing. English is a big department in, in Mary I, about 44% of all art students do English, so about four in 10. Um, and at postgrad level, because we go right through to postgrad as well, we've graduated 57 PhDs and 161 MAs. So if you want to go right through with us and do a master's or do a doctorate, you can do that. We, we, we do all of those. On average, if you do English in first year, somewhere between uh, 75 and 85 percent of you will do English in second year. So we keep an awful lot of our students and we're particularly proud of that. It means that you've enjoyed your first year. We've looked after you in first year and that you'll come on with us then into second and, and final years. And I think I think that's important. Our faculty are very research active. What does that mean? It means that as well as teaching you what other people have said about important works of literature, we write about them ourselves. So we in the last uh, in the last while we've produced 25 single authored books and 23 edited books and there's only six of us. So um, that's not bad going. We're editing academic books for Oxford, Edward. Edward Everett of Root and Rutledge, which means we're setting up series and deciding what gets studied and what doesn't. So you'll be dealing with people who are 
active in the field who are creating knowledge and who, you know, if you've got deadlines, well, we've got deadlines too. So maybe we're a bit more understanding because, because of that. Um, in terms of other subjects, an awful lot of people do English with other subjects because English, of course, is a great teaching subject. Um, so I think about 27% of BA students do English and history, about 20% do English and geography, about 20 again do English and Irish, 16% do English and drama, and about 10% do English and media. So if you're looking to do teaching, English would be one of those subjects because every student in the country has to do English, whether they like it or not. So your chances of employability are huge if you're doing English um, in, a, in, in a case like that. Um, that's an example of, of what we do. In terms of careers after it, a BA won't qualify you for anything on its own. It'll get you up higher in a queue for some jobs, but generally speaking, you're going to have to do something else after it. That would be the norm. Now, in recent years, what a BA does is it can get you into technology and financial service firms where they will teach you the technical stuff. You've shown them you're able to do the information stuff, and of course, you're able to write and understand information and synthesize information. So that's becoming a huge deal. And the big tech companies, you know, your Facebooks, your Googles, your Twitters, they're all very keen on hiring BA graduates. You will have to do more training with them, but the fact that you have a BA is seen as positive, and I think that's a, that's a great thing for, for our students. There's teaching, lecturing, media work, TV again is becoming more and more, technology is becoming a big thing, social media of course is a big thing, digital copywriter is huge now because more and more people are, um, are producing content and they want someone who can re read and write correctly and that is very important and it's an increasingly rare skill. So we're, we're trying to teach that publishing, obviously, and people are now publishing electronically, they're publishing digitally and the, the, the current uh, lockdown situation, the online teaching and a lot of our students now have become extremely skilled in terms of um, like what we're doing here, remote access, VLEs, Zoom, Twitter, Skype, uh, all of those getting stuff across. Uh, getting messages out across different VLEs and different fora. So that's really the way that's really the way I suppose that it, it that it works and how we do it. In terms of um, just what we're doing then and in terms of getting in further contact, if you're interested in English, go on to our website. The WebRI Web website is just www.mic.ul.ie. English is in there in the departments. We have a departmental handbook there as a PDF file. It tells you every it's about I don't know, about 80 pages. It tells you everything we do right across the whole thing. It tells you what we do in um, first year, second year, final year, what the undergraduate dissertation is, how we examine you. We normally break up each semester into four weeks and we give you some kind of an assessment after four weeks. So there's no big massive thing at the end of a semester. We don't really do that. We give you 30 percent like in the first year one, we do 30 percent for fiction. We give you an essay after four weeks. Then we do 30 percent for drama. We might give you a class test after four weeks and then 30 percent for uh, poetry and we might give you um, an exam at the end of that. In the current lockdown situation, all our exams are on um, are done online. Um, that's how we work. You'll get all the information there. If you want to email me, my email address is on um, the website at the bottom of it. I'm quite happy to answer any questions that you have. I suppose the big thing I'd say to you is if you're doing an arts degree, you're going to have to read. That That's what arts degrees are about. And if you're reading, I think it's it's important to read not just textbooks, but imaginative books, because what makes us human isn't so much that we're saying, you know, pass the salt. What makes us human is the way we can say pass the salt, pass the salt, pass the salt, that with the tone behind it is something that other people can read. And that's what you'll be if you do English. You'll be a sophisticated reader and hopefully a clear writer. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. That's great. great. Thank, Thank you so, much, so Eugene. much, Eugene. I have a I couple have of questions, questions for Eugene now. Um, one of the questions that, is, that we've been asked before is, I don't really like poetry. It's my least favourite part of English for my leaving cert. Is there a lot of po poetry on the programme um, and how will I get around the fact that I don't like it? OK, um, the reason people don't like poetry is because in secondary school, because of the exam system, every poem is really taught as if it was a bad novel. 
you're trying to find the story of the poem. Poems don't always have a story. Sometimes poems are just about a feeling or an emotion or something that happens or a response. It doesn't have to have a beginning, middle and end. But if you have to write about it at second level, you're forced to do theme, tone, imagery, that kind of stuff. We don't do that here. We look at poetry as a separate genre and really we see poetry in lots of ways as being able to say things that you can't say in ordinary language, that you can't say in ordinary um, kind of prose or sentences. So we do a fair bit of poetry um, and if it's any consolation, most of our students like it um, because it's taught in a different way and because we, we um, I suppose we all like poetry and we're very keen on it. So because it's taught in a different way, it gives students maybe a better opportunity to get involved with it. But we've had very, very few students say to us at the end of a, a, a year, or at the end of a degree, that they didn't like poetry. We have an awful lot of students saying, I kind of get it now. And once I hear that, I'm happy. So I'd be confident that even if you don't like it, if you're willing to read it and think about it, um, you will like it by the end of it. Thank you, Eugene. And that's a very, very valid point in that we often have students come in with a, maybe a preconceived notion about what subjects are like. Maths would be a good example. They liked maths, but it just really didn't suit them in secondary school and they've excelled at third level. So I think if the interest is there, I think you're right. I, th I think it could be very different at third level. Um, we have another question for you, Eugene. Um, do you study mostly Irish writers or will I get a chance to study international writers too? That's a very good question. Um, we're slightly limited in, in the fact that we, we only do two modules per semester, so we can't do everything and we're well aware of that. So what we've tried to do is a deep dive into different areas. So we will do some Irish writing, certainly. Um, we'll do a bit of Yeats, we'll do some Irish novels, um, but we'll also do South African writers, American writers, English writers, um, and some uh, continental writers in translation. That's in the in the BA and in the MA then after it, we do um, one particular module in Irish writing, but then we do world literature, we do a uh, translation of Chinese writers, um, New Zealand writers, all across the board. So we do some of an awful lot of different writers. And the way we do it is we split each module up into different segments. And as I say, we take a deep dive into two or three books in each module. So you will have access to a number of writers. And that brings up the whole issue of translation. And we'll talk about that as well. We talk about translating work, how it translates, the way it moves along, uh, what you lose in translation, what you gain. So we do, we do a lot of other writers. So it won't be just Irish writers, though we do a number of Irish writers as well. And we do a lot of um, modern. We try and keep as up to date as we possibly can and try and do as many modern writers. And that wouldn't be 20th century anymore. That'd be 21st century. So we're trying to do those as well so that you'll have uh, that you'll have an awareness of what good writing now is like and an awareness of the critical commentary going on it. And because it's new work, you'll be helping to shape that in your own writing as you as you go through. That's great. Thanks, Eugene. One final question for Eugene, and that is, do students get an opportunity to study their favourite writers? Um, yes, they do. In third year, which is an off campus year in the Mary I system where you either go to a different college to study for six months or a year or whether you take a job placement, we do what's known as an undergraduate dissertation. And in the undergraduate dissertation, you write a kind of a, an essay, a long essay, of something between 5,000 and 8,000 words. And in English, we let you pick anything you like. So for a while there, there were an awful lot of people writing about the Twilight novels. Now, we insisted that you wrote about the novels, not just the films. You could write about novels and films, but you couldn't just do the films because that's media and not us. But yeah, you can. You can you can select as long as you can find someone to supervise it. And we're very open about that. Um, we will ask people to do that. I mean, my own interest in Ross and Carol Kelly uh, came about because I had two students one year who wanted to do UGDs in him and I said, who is he? And one of them handed me a book and said, do you want to read that? And I did and I really enjoyed it. And um, the, the end result of it was that a number of other students have done. So yeah, we've students doing stuff on uh, young adult literature, on fairy tales, on folk tales, on the Gothic, on Frankenstein, uh, on translations from French writers, you name it. So if you've got a writer, if you've got to be in your bonnet about a particular writer, 
and you want to study them. Well, come third year, you can write five to eight thousand words and in each of those chapters that you do, we can help you. So you send me a chapter, I read over it, I tell you what's good, what's bad, I ask you to change it. You go back and do it so your grade gets better. So yeah, you can in, in, in a nutshell, Rachel. Yeah, and I enjoy that because a student who's writing about a writer they love will write really decent stuff and it's lovely to see that. That's great. Thanks so much, Eugene. My apologies. So John, did you hear that question? It was a question about getting into sports psychology and how hard is it to get into a job in sports psychology? Uh, OK, uh, thanks for that. Um, the, the different routes into psychology are quite different, to be honest. You, you undertake a, a bachelor's degree such as uh, such as this one to get the general first qualification in psychology and then you go into different areas. So in areas like clinical psychology or educational psychology, people normally work for sort of like national organisations as an employee. If you go into areas like occupational psychology or sports psychology, um, some people work for national governing bodies, but not many sports teams actually employ full time sports psychologists. Normally people will work either as, as self-employed or they might have a job um, in academia, um, such as lecturing and so on, um, and then do some applied work, um, which is that as well. So it's a strange one, sports psychology. If you asked me that question about 15 years ago, I would have said there's very little work, um, but now actually the majority of people, probably 70% at least who are working in sports psychology, are actually working self-employed, um, which is is quite nice to do as well. That's great. Thanks, John. I, I knew that you would be the exact person to answer that question. Um, the next question we have is for Gareth. So it's about music. And Gareth, um, uh, this question is, is music mainly practical or theory based? Um, I'm, I'm here now, yeah. Um, uh, practical or, or theory based, uh, the, the program that we have, the uh, the practical element, we, we ask students to, as I say, they, they have to be able to play an instrument or sing or the, the instrumental lesson students take um, either outside the college, um, it maybe say in the Limerick School of Music or maybe with their own teacher at home uh, where they have, um, have, to, have, have been with a teacher for years, um, or we can facilitate instrumental tuition for students. Who come, who come in. So students actually look after the instrumental uh, and vocal tuition themselves and we can facilitate that with, with introducing them to, uh, to tutors who come into the college then to teach them for that. Um, and they are expected then to perform as part of the programme. So the programme we don't actually teach uh, performance but the students must be able to perform then at the end of each year. In first year there's a short practical about 15 uh, 15 percent in second year, 30 percent of a module, and in final year, a 50 percent, um, uh, a substantial 50 percent uh, of a module, but 15 minutes, about a 15 minute performance. So you're expected to perform, but we then we will we'll discuss with you when you come in how you're going to continue with your your instrumental tuition. That's great, Gareth. I have a number of questions here about music. Um, some you may have touched on during your presentation, but no harm to go over them again. I have a question here about what would be the possible careers if you have a degree in music? <clears throat> yeah, if if they uh, if, if you look at the, uh, it'll be there, the careers, uh, there was a slide on careers. And one thing I do recommend is that you go to uh, some of the, uh, just type in careers in music um, into a Google engine and you'll see uh, come up various websites. There's one called Prospects. Um, and there's a careersinmusic.com, and they give you a, a huge list of different careers. The main careers, of course, uh, standard careers are either performance um, uh, or or uh, or teaching. Um, but there are very many people go into arts administration or or music therapy or or music publishing, music librarianship, journalism. There's very many different career paths, and and one of the uh, one of the points I mentioned was that many employers also uh, are interested in music graduates because of various transferable skills um, um, that they would have acquired. So, but but I would recommend if you're interested in studying music as, as a career, uh, do do look at all the different possibilities. You'll come across many different different types of uh, careers that you might not have ever thought of on, on these websites and they're very easy to find. Mm -hmm. 
That's great, Gareth. Thanks. That's very useful advice. Um, another question about music is higher level leaving cert music enough of a requirement? <clears throat> yeah, we, we don't we don't insist on it um, because some schools might not offer it. Um, but uh, most most students would have probably taken uh, uh, taken music in the in the leaving certificate. Um, and uh, uh, so so no, it's not a requirement, um, but uh, but I say many students will have done it anyway. They will have done it coming in. But if you're, if you're coming from a school that didn't offer it and you haven't done it, uh, that's 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 not a problem. OK, that's great. And one final question for you, Gareth. Um, is there much emphasis on popular music and music technology throughout or is that later in the course? It's, uh, it, it is it is uh, later in the course. It comes in it comes in final year. Uh, in final year, there's a module on popular music um, and we build in uh, uh, we build in some some concerts into that and concert visits into that. There's popular music. That's one module, uh, and then there's the module in music technology. Music technology can is offered as a component um, in 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 uh, in various uh, modules in a small way as we go through. But the actual module itself is in final year, so they're they're at they're at the, they're at the uh, in 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 the fourth year of the program. That's great. Thanks so much, Gareth. Um, I have another question now for John in psychology. Um, so what kind of careers do graduates of psychology go on to? Thanks, Rachel. Um, it's it's a very varied career, as I mentioned in the in the talk. Um, essentially, if you're interested in working with people and either helping people or helping to get the most out of people or organisations or groups, people go into those kind of areas. So typically people undertake a, an undergraduate degree like this one, and then you can decide, do you want to become an actual psychologist? Which means you have to go on and study at postgraduate level and, and do some more qualifications and then work in one of the areas mentioned. Or do you want to take that um, understanding that you have and apply it in health or education or business or marketing or any of those kind of areas as well. So we actually have graduates that are working all over the world in in, in various jobs here and there. And uh, personally, I quite like that because I know when I was a student, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grow up. And if I'm honest, I still don't really. Um, but uh, it, it means that you've always got that that option because what you have is a skill set to basically understand people. So short of working somewhere where you don't work with people, um, then then that's a it's a useful route in that sense. That's great. Thanks, John. And a very important point is that you're you're quite young when you're choosing your degree program and people's likes and dislikes and what you want to do in your life changes as you age. So it's a good idea to keep an open mind and uh, keep an, uh, keep your options open if you like. Um, we have a question for Christiane. Um, what are the benefits of studying a foreign language like German? None. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. No, I, I'm trying to turn my camera on. Oh, there it is. OK. Well, I mean, as I said in my presentation, there are lots of benefits to uh, studying German. I mean, all the intercultural skills that you require, you know, that you're able to communicate successfully with speakers of a different language. Um, I mean, all the job opportunities that that you'll have if you uh, study German. Um, but I think also it opens up a new perspective on your own culture. Um, I mean, now with Brexit, Irish-German relations are closer than ever before. They're probably more important than they've, they've ever been. Um, and German as a skill is so underrepresented in Ireland. Um, I mean, they're constantly looking for German speakers in Ireland. Uh, and that's not only uh, the Irish-German business lobby uh, here in Dublin, but, uh, you know, I mean, all branches, tourism, um, translation uh, offices, but even, I mean, we've had students going into uh, law offices, um, you know, being trained as lawyers while they were already employed just because they desperately needed somebody who was able to read German letters or, you know, write uh, answer letters uh, that were written in German. Um, 
I also had people going, you know, getting jobs in accountancy uh, firms because they had the, you know, because they had German. So uh, there are lots of opportunities uh, with German with students going into politics, uh, into journalism. Um, so yeah, there, there are lots of <laughs> advantages. I think it, it just opens up huge opportunities, especially now, because it is such a skill uh, you know that that because it is a skill that is so needed in Ireland today. That's great, Christiane. And yes, as you said, particularly after Brexit, it's even more important. Um, mm. So I have one more question for Christiane, and that's about the German Admitio program. So. Yeah. Do students who have not done German before, who take on the Abinitio um, German, are mm -hmm. they at a distinct disadvantage to those who have done German for their leaving cert? Is it very hard? No, no, it's not. I mean, of course, the first year is, um, yeah, I mean, you're exposed to a new language, so you have to keep with the program. You know, I mean, you uh, if you enjoy learning languages you know this is for you you you'll be exposed to all this new information you'll develop your vocabulary you'll you know become familiar with the structure of the language but i mean the course is actually so much fun and uh, usually our students enjoy it tremendously um when we can we actually offer an intensive course in the summer for students that want to go on with German, it's free. It's offered by assistants that are provided to the department by the German government. And um, and then in year two, you'll still be supported as a, you know, a, a former beginner, um, but you're slowly fed into the program. So you're, you're being slowly supported into the, the you know, regular advanced program. And to be honest, I mean, students catch up tremendously quickly. And um, our very, very best students, the ones that came out with um, the, you know, medal in German studies uh, with a bachelor degree, often have been Abinicio students you know, who go abroad for a year and they come back and they're a near native. I mean, it's fantastic how, you know, you can actually develop a language from zero. You, know? you can, you can you know, learn the language and um, become really proficient in it within the four years at Mary Immaculate College. That's great. Thanks, Christiane. Uh, John, I have another question for you, and that is, is psychology quite scientific as a subject? Would I need to be good at maths? <laughs> um, it's, it's scientific in the sense of you have to be able to think conceptually, OK, because we're, it's, uh, all, all these ideas that we have, think about how, how we describe people as being um, are extroverted people more likely to get stressed in this situation. Well, the idea of being extrovert and the idea of being stressed, they're like these abstract concepts. You can't actually just pick up a block of stress or a block of extroversion, okay? So you have to be able to think in those terms and, and think very logically and reason. So it's scientific in that sense. Now we do collect data and we do a lot of data analysis. However, that's more like applied statistics. So that's quite different from maths. So we'll use quite a lot of numbers, but we don't do calculations. Thankfully, some really bright people somewhere have kind of made all the computer programs that do a lot of the a lot of the number crunching itself. So you have to be able to logically think, OK, I've collected this data. What does it mean? And how do I know if this group of people are more stressed than that group of people and whether something I did made a difference to it? So we'll use numbers a lot, but we use them in an applied sense. We don't actually do any kind of calculus. Um, so in a long winded way, you have to be good at the concepts of science, but you don't necessarily have to be a, a good mathematician. That's great. Thanks, John. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, 
at the end of the questions, we're going to try and re, re have another go at, at presenting the um, Eugene O'Brien's presentation on English. So please do bear with us because when we're finished here with the questions, we are going to make another attempt to tell you all about what it might be like to study English as part of the BA degree. So I have one more question now for Christiane. Um, I'm thinking of going on to primary school teaching after my I've completed the arts degree. Would German still be of benefit to me? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, the Irish government has recognised the fact that European languages need to be taught in primary schools. Um, and in at Mary Immaculate College, we actually have a number of modules in the education which we offer as part of the education program, um, which focus on um, you know, the incorporation of German language teaching in primary schools. So um, despite the fact that German is currently not um, you know, one you know, language taught in primary schools in Ireland, I mean, it, it is only Irish and, uh, uh, Irish and English at the moment. Um, I suspect that um, you know the Modern Languages Initiative will be brought in again. Uh, it was stopped a few years ago uh, due to the financial crisis, um, but uh, you know, it is so important that we start earlier with um, you know language training, and um, you know it it is such an important skill to have. And the Irish government has identified German as one of the the key languages, so I'd be very surprised if um, you know this didn't pose an advantage in schools, in primary schools, if you went in there as a, a primary school teacher, uh, and you could say, I've, you know, I'm also able to learn, you know, teach German. Yeah. Yes, that's a very, very valid point. So you would bring an extra dimension to yeah. um, the primary school that you would be applying to, which is a very good point and would help to make you stand out from the crowd. We've almost reached the end of our questions. I have one final question for John about psychology and the question is about accreditation. So the question is, I've heard so much about accreditation, but why is it so important? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, it's essentially the accreditation is like a hallmark of uh, quality for a program. So if it's accredited, it shows that uh, the program is of quality. Now, how does that affect you as a student? Well, if you just want to get your bachelor's degree and you don't want to pursue psychology at postgraduate level, it doesn't actually make an awful lot of difference. If, however, you want to go on and study a master's degree in psychology because you want to become a psychologist, you'll need to have an accredited undergraduate degree. So if your undergraduate degree is not accredited, you'll find yourself having to do what we call a conversion course, which means the master's degree you do will probably have to be a year longer to make up for the lack of accreditation at undergraduate level. So it essentially saves you uh, a year a little further down the line. That's great. Thanks, John. And actually, we, we touched on it last night as well when we had the general information session about the Bachelor of Arts. And it was worth noting that um, places on those qualifying courses that you have to take when your degree is not accredited are very hard to come by. They're like hen's teeth. So often students have to wait because they won't get a place the first time around, which will delay their studies further. So it's just, just something to bear in mind that sometimes these programmes are very popular and there aren't as many places as there are as there is demand. So we've come to the end of our questions. Um, I really hope that you found tonight's information session informative and that we've answered any questions that you might have. But if you have further queries or other things occur to you between now and you're filling out your CEO form, please do contact the departments directly. All of their contact details are on the college website. So that's www.mic.ul.ie. You'll find the contact details, the email addresses for all of the speakers that you heard here tonight on the website. Just simply go to the relevant department, find the email address and send them on your queries. They will be more than happy to help. They're very used to getting questions in from prospective students 
all types of questions and they are more than happy to help in any way they can. So all that is left for me to do is to remind you that tomorrow's session we are looking at five more subjects on the BA degree. They are geography, media, drama and theatre studies, philosophy and Gwilga and that session will again take place at 5 p.m. tomorrow evening and I really hope you can join us for that. So thank you very much for your um, patience um, apologies for the technical difficulties and just to remind you that the tonight's presentations and indeed all the presentations from this week's uh, focus on art series will be available um, after tonight uh, on the Mary Matthew College website. So you'll be able to go back and watch the sessions again if you want to. So thank you very much for your patience and your attendance and we say good night. <laughs>